the cold, murky, plankton-rich waters off Canada's east coast are the richest fishing grounds in the world. Cod, herring, capelin, tuna, and many other species have been harvested in massive numbers here since the day the North American continent was first discovered. But there is one other creature that harvests these waters and has done so since the beginning of time. In the past, these giant hunters of the deep arrived here silently, mysteriously, only to become another of the hunted Today, there is a ban on whaling in Canada's oceans, but this place remains where whales go to die. Long before Europeans appeared off Canada's east coast, great pods of whales were migrating north every year from their Caribbean calving grounds right whales to feed in the Bay of Fundy, and humpbacks to the Gulf of Maine and the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. To 15th century Basque whalers, the right whale was the right whale to hunt. It didn't sink when harpooned, giving up its blubber for oil lamps and bone for women's corsets, easier than any other whale. As North America was colonized, great maritime traditions were born. One of them, the autumn whale hunt. Supply and demand seemed limitless, and whalers complied, killing thousands every year for over 500 years. By the beginning of the 20th century, the Atlantic was tapped out. Whale populations had been reduced to 10% of their historic levels, and the northern right whale once numbering in the hundreds of thousands, was almost extinct. Today, whale watching has replaced whale hunting, but for the right whale, wholesale slaughter has taken its toll. With about 300 known animals remaining, the right is the world's most endangered whale, and the numbers continue to decline. More right whales die from entanglement in fishing nets and ship collisions than are born, driving the species closer to extinction and setting the stage for a tragedy of global proportion. But for the last 20 years, a new breed of maritimer has surfaced, dedicated to solving the dilemma of an ancient animal's survival in a modern world. They are the whale doctors, and their job is to get as close as possible to the planet's largest, most powerful animal, and free them from fishnets that can maim or kill. Out here, more than a whale's life is on the line. This is a dangerous occupation. In Tiverton, Nova Scotia, on the east coast of the Bay of Fundy, science, governments, and fishermen have come together to discuss the realities of traditional maritime life conflicting with the survival of a species. Dr. Moira Brown of East Coast Ecosystems, a right whale research group, hosts the conference. This is the only large whale species that is in danger of going extinct in our grandchildren's lifetime.
there is increasing levels of awareness amongst the shipping industry and the fishing industry that these animals are not extinct. They're still alive, they're out there, and they're struggling. Fishermen have come to this conference because they are the front line. It's their nets and their livelihood whales become entangled in. Freeing a whale from a fisherman's net would be impossible without their cooperation. Dr. Charles Stormy Mayo of the Center for Coastal Studies is also on the front line, disentangling whales for over 15 years. The problem we all will have when we see entangled animals, since uh, they are pretty precious creatures if they're right whales, is trying to figure out if it's towing gear, whether it's really superficial <coughs> or whether it is not. I think I'd rather be talking about untangling whales than doing it. Dr. John Lean of Newfoundland uh, just, is the first person to ever disentangle a whale. And since then, he's saved more whales uh, than anyone else in the world. I was working at the university, and fishermen begin to call the university and say, I've got a trapped whale. Um, and they'd say, well, why call us? And they said, well, I've called fisheries, I've called wildlife, I've called the Coast Guard, and nobody will help me. And at that time in Newfoundland, fishermen said it's the worst problem we really have with the fixed gear cod traps and gillnet fishery. The meeting adjourns to a more appropriate setting, crossing the Bay of Fundy to Grand Manan Island in New Brunswick for on the water training. Hey, whales at two, three o'clock. Suddenly, the training turns real. Entangled in fishing gear from a lobster trap, a two-year-old female right whale surfaces in front of them. The world's best disentanglers are in the right place at the right time and quickly prepare to hook on to the fishing line. But the whale dives. When it surfaces, they're ready to try another strategy, grapple onto the line to secure a marker buoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both of you get it. Okay, you're starting now to starboard. 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 Okay, I got it here. Take her. Neutral. They attach the boy, making it easier to keep track of the whale. Now the real chase is on. We got the line running. There we go. Yeah, we do. We're a lot better shape than we usually are. I think what we're going to try to do is to cut the right side to start out with. Using a Zodiac inflatable, the best platform from which to disentangle a whale, Stormy Mayo plans to get as close as possible and cut away the fishing gear with a knife attached to a long pole. When the whale surfaces again, the team will move in. Mayo succeeds in cutting the line and hauls in the gear. This disentanglement was a complete success. For the best disentanglers in the world, it's been a good day. But as John Lean knows, this was an easy one. Boy, that was impressive. Newfoundland, where Canada's east coast tumbles into the sea, and where humpback whales come to dine like they have for thousands, if not millions of years. Humpbacks feed in packs, herding fish into compact schools. forcing them to the surface, and then devouring them in one gulp. Humpbacks eat massive amounts of capelin, a small fish also eaten by cod, the fish that has driven away of life here for over 500 years. Ever since there was a Newfoundland fishing industry, humpbacks have been entangling themselves in fishermen's nets. In the past, it wasn't a problem. Kill the whale, but lose the net. Today, with the cod fishery in crisis, the loss of a single net is a disaster, like the loss of a single whale. 
We lost half our trap, right? We lost five thousand dollars then. And uh, latter, it's not only five thousand dollars on the trap. You'd lose maybe a week's fishing because you had to, what we call you bring it in on the meadow and you had to go get twine and you had to try to fix it up again, right? And that's one of the worst nightmares that a fisherman could ask for. Yes. That's how close it was to shore. Dr. John Lean of Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland, has saved more whales and more fishing nets than anyone else in the world. It all began in 1978 with a phone call from a fisherman with a humpback entangled in his net. For three months, the whale had struggled to free itself, and no one could solve the problem. Could lean. John Lean was no whale expert. In fact, he was a biologist okay, studying seabirds, okay. but neither was anyone else. No Armed with a sawed-off hockey the stick the with a hook on one end, it's some garden thing. clippers, okay, well, a snorkel, and not much control. else, he decided to give it a try. All right. I hadn't done anything with whales except sit beside one for a month. And so we did some figuring, and I thought we could build some equipment. So we went back to the university, built some equipment to let the whale go. One whale led to another, and Lean became a one-of-a-kind expert. The problem is largely one of teenage whales, uh, and it's probably just reckless driving, basically. The, uh, over and over again, it's this size humpback that gets caught in gear. Incredibly, Lean was soon disentangling 40 whales a year. Okay, that's over good. time, he perfected his techniques and learned that no two whales or disentanglements are ever the same. This humpback is trapped in a gill net, anchored to the seabed and unable to move. If it's not freed, it will die. Every time I go to an entrapment still, I'm afraid. I'm not afraid of the whale, and I'm not afraid of the fishermen, but uh, you're just afraid you're going to fail. Uh, there's a lot on the line, and it, it, there's no recipe, there's no set way. Um, you really are figuring it out uh, each time. Humpbacks are one of the most mild-mannered of the large whales, but too much prodding on the surface can arouse even the gentlest of giants. The whale swims away free as Dr. John Lean dries himself off. <laughs> Lean's success has saved whales and changed attitudes. And he said, you know, boys, we're, we're here to help you, right? And a lot of the fishermen, and even I was really, you know, like reluctant to even let him aboard the boat. It really did take him take a while to convince them that we were saving their fishing gear as well as the whale, and uh, that was important to them. You get a humpback whale in a $10,000 trap, you can lose it in, within an hour, and, uh, and John really, really done us uh, a favor. Uh, here we have a legacy of feeling not so good about uh, environmental groups who protest our seal hunt, and they were suspicious that, yeah, here's another save the seal, save the whale, type operation. Lean's efforts to save whales and nets created a new relationship between nature and culture in Newfoundland. He's added to that relationship by pioneering technology to help prevent entanglements, like the acoustic pinger, which warns the whale that a fishing net is nearby. There's a beep goes out every three seconds, right? And this one worked really good. Well, all you do is just you snap this onto your about three fathom under water on, on your skirt lines, and you let them down, and you have, you, have, you have five on your trap, and you'd have five more on your leader. So you'd have around 10 on, on, on a cod trap. And they work really good. You'd, you'd be surprised to see them working. When you see the whales coming, and when they pick up the beeper, they just turn from your trap. After more than 20 years and hundreds of successful rescues, John Lean is known as the godfather of whale disentanglements. But perhaps his greatest success is turning a one-man part-time job 
into a full-time rescue operation run by the Canadian Coast Guard, which means Lean's legacy will continue. The best ones are always the ones where at the end the whale swims away just bare naked. It doesn't have anything on it. Uh, and you know that that animal has a very good chance, as good a chance as before he was caught. And then where you go to the house and have tea and you talk about it. Before John Lean answered a phone call in 1978 from a frustrated fisherman, almost 50% of entangled humpbacks were dying in the net. Since then, 90% are swimming free. The highest tides in the world scour the rocky shores of the Bay of Fundy, shared by the provinces of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and the state of Maine. It is a rich underwater ecosystem, supporting a vast diversity of marine life, and one of the richest fishing grounds in the world. Like Newfoundland's maritime culture, fishing has been a way of life here for centuries. And like the humpback, the northern right whale has been drawn to these waters for millennia. As many as 200, two-thirds of the world's most endangered whale population, spend the summer feeding in Fundy's plankton-rich waters. This is the greatest concentration of northern rights found anywhere on Earth. Yet no one knows where most of them come from. In fact, there's little we do know about these whales. Studying whales is a real challenge. Spending 99% of their lives underwater, there's no precise way to learn how they age, mate, or migrate. Even weighing them is a problem. With so many right whales in such a small area, another curious species has been attracted to the Bay of Fundy the scientist. For over 15 years, Dr. Moira Brown has been studying right whales in the bay. Her work focuses on genetics. We simply fire the, the, the arrow from the crossbow and it hits the whale and bounces right off and with it uh, takes a, s a little sample of skin and that's actually just a huge amount of raw material um, with which to do genetic sampling. One of the things we'd like to do with the genetics study that we have going today is create uh, a family tree for the living right whales. So within the next few years, we should be able to see exactly who's related to who. One thing that is known for certain is that right whales feed and breed at the surface, putting them on a collision course with heavy commercial fishing and shipping activity in the bay. This is Staccato, a breeding age female struck and killed by a ship in the spring of 1999. Over 25 years old and the mother of at least six calves, Staccato was well known to scientists in the bay. A team from the Center for Coastal Studies in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, led by Dr. Stormy Mayo, conducted the autopsy. It's really spectacular. It is a sad paradox of whale science. The easiest way to study the animal is when it's dead on the beach. The autopsy reveals the whale's back and jaw had been broken by the force of the massive collision. Breeding age females are the most valuable members of any endangered species, giving staccato's death global impact. It's late summer, and Deborah Tobin of East Coast Ecosystems in Nova Scotia surveys the bay for right whales, monitoring their movements and searching for entangled animals. Suddenly, a right whale, identified as number 2710, is sighted dragging fishing gear. Tobin relays its coordinates to a disentanglement team standing by on the water. 
A multinational team is deployed. Moira Brown arrived from Lubeck, Maine, where her summer research program is based. But for now, her science is forgotten. And Stormy Mayo, the most experienced right whale disentangler on the East Coast, has traveled north from Massachusetts. With help from above, the team quickly locates 2710. Then Stormy Mayo, here in the white helmet, gets to work. 2710 is a two-year-old female, entangled in a single fishing line, running through her mouth, across the blowholes, and around the right flipper. The first order of business is to slow the whale down by kegging it. In the old days, the way the whalers used to do it was to attach wooden kegs to a whale to slow it down after they'd harpooned it. And we're sort of using the same technique. The difference is, is we want the whale alive at the end of the day, whereas the whalers had a different objective. So instead of kegs, we're using these orange inflatable buoys. So that sort of maximizes our time to work with the whale. 2710 has become agitated and extremely evasive. She keeps diving and thrashing her tail at the surface, a warning to the disentanglers to keep their distance. The entangled lines are old and rotting. Every time they try to attach a kegging boy, the line breaks free, frustrating their attempts to slow the whale. But I don't know if we're gonna get a shot at this whale again. If it's, you could see it worked, but the damn gear didn't hold. That, that's the reason we didn't do it earlier. We, I mean, we could have put pressure on earlier, but we wanted to see if we could get another attachment, but we knew the gear was, was compromised and that's, that's where our problem was. But the rotting gear becomes a benefit. Clear. 2710's own thrashing tears free 25 feet of line, creating a partial success. For the moment, the whale is out of danger. Meanwhile, the Skymaster spots another entangled right whale, number 1158, an adult female dragging a metal pole and boy. He popped up behind us while we were blowing up the inflatable. 58. With 2710 out of danger, they pivot to investigate 1158. They get the buoy up behind them. Stormy tossed the grapple. And let's see what they got. This entanglement is not considered to be life-threatening. Suddenly, Skymaster spots another entangled whale, number 2030, another female. A quick assessment reveals that an entangled line has cut into her back, causing serious injury. There have never been so many entangled whales at one time, in one area. Multiple lines of fishing net have dug deeply into 2030 causing a massive gash on her back. It appears she's been towing this gear around for months, and the injury is life-threatening. A life and death struggle in the bay has begun. With light failing, a satellite boy is attached to 2030 to track her overnight. Tomorrow is another day. Song of the Whale, a vessel supplied by the International Federation of Animal Welfare, has been tracking 2030 overnight. Stormy Mayo and his team in the Zodiac keg the whale quickly. Their plan is to grapple onto the line they've attached and pull themselves up to just behind her tail flukes. The added drag should tire her out and give them time to assess her condition. The whale tows their boat across the ocean. In whaling language, this is known as a Nantucket sleigh ride.
right whales have amazing flexibility, capable of touching their noses with their tails. Any time the disentanglement team gets in front of those two-ton flukes, their lives are in danger. But the risk is worth it, if 2030 can be saved. I think all of us were just shocked at, at how bad her condition was and how sad she looked, and, and, and I couldn't stop thinking about that. She's been laboring for a very long time with a very bad situation, and one has to imagine in, in terrible pain. The cut is probably a maximum of eight inches to 10 inches deep and um, perhaps 14 feet long. It's the worst I've ever seen. No matter how injured the animal is, she remains incredibly strong and incredibly dangerous. A whale is a highly evolved, deeply sensitive animal. Each whale has its own personality and behaves differently when entangled. 2030 feels her pain, but she doesn't know the whale doctors are trying to help her. She obviously knew we were there and she didn't want us there. And uh, it's an assumption that that's going through her mind, but she, what was not an assumption was her reaction, which was to slash wildly with her tail towards us. Certainly vintage right whale, immense power and precision. The whale continues to dive for up to 10 minutes at a time, leaving the team helpless on the surface. Kegging 2030 and the Nantucket sleigh ride have not slowed the whale down, and the team cannot get close enough to cut away the damaging line. They take a break to talk strategy. A new technique is required. When 2030 surfaces, Mayo decides to approach her aggressively. He's equipped with a long pole with a razor-sharp quick-release knife blade attached. The new idea is to hook a line, then release the blade. The team is working in front of the whale's tail now, in a position of extreme danger. Finally, the knife blade is attached. The whale flees, but the team pursues her, grappling onto the line and pulling hard on the knife blade. Mayo pulls and pulls. Finally, the blade slices the line. 2030 is partially disentangled. But the line cutting deepest into the whale's body remains. It's taken all day to achieve a partial success. Now, with daylight fading, a new problem appears. Fog is moving into the bay. The kegging gear is taken off the whale and a satellite buoy attached. The team decides to stay on the bay overnight, tracking 2030, ready to try again at first light. One hundred kilometers south in Bar Harbor, Maine, disentanglement director Bob Bowman tracks the whale's movements. 2030 appears to be leaving the bay for open ocean, heading south at eight knots, fleeing those who would save her. Then fog blankets the bay completely, and the disentanglement is suspended. In Bar Harbor, the sun is still shining. And for Bowman, it's back to the drawing board. New tools need to be designed to cut the lines on 2030's back. 
We've developed a variety of tools just out of necessity. Uh, you can't uh, very often find off-the-shelf equipment that works quite works very well for doing dis uh, whale disentanglement. This particular one was just made for, especially for uh, right whale 2030. Um, and uh, the way it would work is that it would hook into, uh, you would use it to hook into a line. Uh, for instance, we'll just hook into this line on the boat here and hope we don't cut it. Um, and then the pole will pull off. And you now have a knife attached. Uh, the other end of this rope could be attached to a large buoy or to a boat. Uh, it's going to cut very quickly. It will also lock in place. It won't even slide. Meanwhile, up the coast in Lubeck, fog continues to be a problem. And there's a new one. A fisherman has reported sighting a dead whale. Immediately, a boat is sent out to investigate, but no one dares ask the question. Is it 2030? No. Half-tide rock could be mixed in. You hadn't seen a dead whale floating around in here, have you? No, haven't heard anyone mention about it. Thanks a lot. Finally, they have their answer. A dead three-ton basking shark that's been trapped in a net. Relief is tempered by the sight of the rotting shark. It's got line all over it. So you can see the gills. For the moment, 2030 is still alive, somewhere out there in the fog. Five days later, the fog has broken, and so has some good news. 2030 has returned to the Bay of Fundy. In Lubeck, Maine, home base for scientists studying whales in the bay, Moira Brown calls Stormy Mayo with the news. So she's pretty much right in the area that we were working with her um, last week, so she's right. come back up from the south, so yeah, she's so a lot more accessible. What you call the groove. That's pretty close to what we call the groove, yeah. yeah. So yeah. she may well be in amongst uh, yeah. other whales. And, and the uh, Song of the Whale has returned to Graham and Ann. They returned to Graham and Ann today. Uh -huh. So they'll also be available to go out and uh, help with Good. tracking. That would be great. All right, Stormy, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. And it uh, looks like we're going to hopefully have a couple of good days to take a shot at this yep. whale. Thanks for your help. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. The next morning, Stormy Mayo, Ed Lyman, and a new team member, Dave Matilla, returned from Cape Cod. You know, I'm getting less and less excited about going up with the pole anywhere, anywhere where you end up um, falling back near the tail, because that the tail is. Uh, <laughs> I don't like the tail. I don't like the tail. The team is ready to try again. Skymaster gets into position to spot 2030. To slow down the whale so they can work on it safely, the team has invented a harness to be thrown like a lasso over the tail and then tethered to a boat. It's risky business. No one has ever attempted to harness a large whale before. The first chance will be their best chance before the whale is aware of their presence and becomes agitated. I'm taping. I'm taping. They approach slowly, hoping not to startle her. I'm trying to tape the flukes, yeah. We are, are all concerned that her entanglement is so severe that she might not survive. And that's why we have been trying to um, throw all of our efforts at her entanglement. But it's, it's, the gear is embedded in her back and around her flippers, and it couldn't be more difficult to try and disentangle this whale. She also still has enough energy to, um, to use her, her tail to defend herself, because you know, she doesn't know we're trying to help her. They wait for their opportunity. Everything is in position. 2030 surfaces in front of them. The tail fluke comes up, and they drop the harness. But there's a hitch. One of the three lines doesn't release, creating a dangerous situation. Pull, pull, pull. The whale dives, and if Mayo doesn't disengage their connecting line to the whale, 2030 could pull them under. The team waits for the whale to resurface. 
and moves in to try again. She's circling back. 2030 is an ornery, belligerent leviathan, refusing to cooperate. Again, failure. Would you object if I um, had some shot All day, they try. And all day, they fail. The day ends slowly, with no success. Overnight, a new problem has emerged. Hurricane Floyd, lashing Florida's coast, has turned and is moving northward with the Bay of Fundy directly in its path. But Floyd isn't due yet, and dawn in Lubeck brings a new day and another new strategy. But will this be their last chance to save 2030? Oh, so we switched up good. That's it now. Once again, they locate 2030 quickly, circling in the bay. Immediately, they begin to re-keg the animal. Taking a Nantucket sleigh ride, they move in to check her condition. By midday, They've attached more kegging gear to 2030 than to any other whale in history. Will they finally succeed in slowing her down? They move in to begin cutting at the lines causing the massive gash on the whale's back, using one of Bob Bowman's new knives. Unbelievably, 2030 dives, pulling all the boys under with her. She may be badly injured, but she remains incredibly strong. Diving. Diving. Another day with no success. And now the hurricane is on the horizon. We've been on top of that whale on and off for five days. And we're awfully close, but she's awfully badly entangled. And so we leave her with a, an uncertain future. Once again, a satellite boy is attached to 2030, but the rescue is suspended until Hurricane Floyd passes. Hurricane Floyd, now downgraded to a tropical storm, still packs a punch, forcing boat traffic off the Bay of Fundy and halting any efforts to disentangle right whale 2030. When the storm clears, the whale has disappeared from the bay. Hurricane season signals the change to autumn in the Maritimes, and 2030 and 2710, both towing satellite tracking buoys, have begun their journey south to winter cabin grounds off the north coast of Florida. We unfortunately have had to abandon our efforts to 2030 right now. She has left the Bay of Fundy. But the good thing is, is that she does have a, a transmitter attached to her, a satellite transmitter, so we will be able to track her, lo her, her location. And if she does come near shore again, we can try and disentangle her. A month later, the signal from 2030's satellite boy stops moving, triggering a search to discover the whale's fate. I got two o'clock. Has the marker broken free, or worse? 10 kilometers off the New Jersey coast, the boy is located, but no 2030. The, uh, the snap uh, broke off of it. That was one of the choices for losing it. For the moment, 2030 remains out there in the open ocean. But the question remains, is she still alive? The answer comes a short time later, 
when 2030 is sighted. Have you made an arrangement with Dead in the water, off the same New Jersey coast. Dense webs of fish netting are found wrapped around her flippers, and a nylon line stretches across her back, almost sawing her in half. The entanglement is worse, much worse, than anyone expected. One of the planet's greatest ancient creatures, ravaged by a fish line. The summer began with a population of 60 breeding age females. Now, only 57 remain. For the most endangered whale species on the planet, a catastrophic loss. Like landmines in a forgotten war zone, an unknown number of so-called ghost nets float abandoned in the North Atlantic. Lost in storms, marker boys cut by boat traffic, the nylon mesh continues to snare fish as it drifts silently across the ocean. Today, over 60% of right whales bear the white scars of net entanglements. There seems to be no escape. If the northern right whale becomes extinct, um, it will be the direct result of our inability uh, to stop it from happening. Uh, I think it would be, if, if you've spent any time at all out watching these animals in their natural environment, it's a wildlife spectacle. And, and uh, as a country, I think Canada should value right whales and the fact that they spend a good six months of their lives in our waters as a national heritage. Attempting to cut now, it looks like. Oh, gotta, but there are cut, successes. Like. In September, a month before 2030 dies, 1158 is disentangled from its net. Got one, I heard him say. Whoa, whoa. The whale just got really freed. And on the same day, off the coast of Maine, Bob Bowman hauls in 2710 satellite boy with 95 feet of fishing line attached to it. Luckily, the whale has freed herself from most of her entanglement. 450 and there's no sign of any gear on this whale. But John Lean and the others know that disentangling whales is only a band-aid treatment to a global problem. Biodegradable fishing nets, acoustic pingers to warn whales away from fish nets, and the rerouting of commercial shipping lanes around prime whale habitat are all a part of the solution. Until then, the whale doctors have more work ahead of them. Whales generally have come to sort of symbolize everything that's right or wrong with the ocean. And uh, in the past, we've abused them horribly by killing way too many and by killing them badly. Uh, and I think now people feel if there's hope for oceans, the whale is the symbol of that hope. If we can save whales, we can save oceans. The giants of the deep have owned the oceans for millennia, living symbols of the untamed and mysterious. The humpback in Canada will survive, largely because the fishing industry in Newfoundland is declining. But the right whale cannot escape its tragic past, and at least for now, its tragic destiny.